Hi, everyone. Uh, just want to welcome Nathan here. Um, really a pleasure to have him. The cookbooks are the most amazing cookbooks. I don't even know whether to call them cookbooks that I've ever seen in my entire life. So, Nathan, can I first start out by saying, do we call these cookbooks? I, I, I call it... A Come on over here. Yes. You're fine. I call it a cookbook. Okay. Um, now, it's in six volumes, admittedly, um, but it started off in my mind as being one volume, and so I think okay. it was a cookbook. Okay, so cookbooks, all right. All right, well, uh, you got a little presentation. Okay. I'll talk to you after that. And cool. Welcome. Okay, well, thanks. <clears throat> so uh, I just want to tell you a little bit about the book. Um, there's some fun facts we have on it. Six volumes, 2,438 pages, 1.1 million words. If you put those in a single line of text, it would be seven and a half miles long. It's not clear why you'd want to do that, but we thought it was kind of a cool statistic. We took 150,000 pictures and 3,200 of them were good enough for the book. Um, that's actually a good ratio, believe it or not. Uh, 1,522 recipes, 72 chefs from around the world gave us uh, recipes to use in the book. We had six research cooks full-time for three years, um, 44 writers, editors, and art staff all together, 40 pounds, and my favorite statistic, four pounds of ink. When you get a book made, the, the printers make a blank book um, and so I said, well, gee, how close is this to the real book? And they said, well, it'll be about a half inch thicker and four pounds heavier. And I said, why? They said, the ink. I said, you're kidding me. But they said, well, actually, if you think about it, a full page photo has about a thousandth of an inch of ink on it. Most of our pages have photos, a thousandth of an inch times 2,400. <laughs> so thick black ink. Um, and uh, one of the questions that I always get, uh, so I'll just, uh, uh, anticipated here is, I'm kind of a digital guy. Why am I talking about ink at all? Uh, why don't I have it uh, as a digital thing? And there's two reasons. The first reason is we made a decision about what platform to target about two years ago. Uh, and it, we figured that's what it would take to do the first uh, version. And two years ago, there was no uh, iPad. Uh, there was only Kindle. And here's one of the pictures of the book. The Kindle version is just pathetic because it's small and it's black and white and it's not made for images. Um, the iPad version is better, but even so, you would have to do amazing amounts of pan and scan and lots of, of work to take these very large, beautiful photos that we've done and try to adapt them for online. Eventually, we'll do that, but to me, the reason to do it isn't because I want to make a cheap version or a more portable version, well, those are both have some value, it's to make a really cool version that uses interactivity in lots of ways, then pretty much it starts being a software project and we'll get to it, but after, uh, after the print version. The other reason we did it, frankly, is that today there's a, a paper-based book is still the best way to get this material out to the people that are interested in it. So we did a lot of work to try to make sure that the quality was very high. Um, you can see that the industry standard uh, is about 175 lines. That's considered a very good halftone screen for color reproduction. A really good art book has 200, but there's no reason to have those fixed grids anymore if you have computers. So we use something called stochastic screening. And stochastic screening, as you can see, gives you just a r ridiculously better looking photo uh, with effectively the same pr printing technology. Uh, we also uh, made sure we had great inks. So uh, industry standard inks have lots of out of gamut colors. There's colors you can take a picture of with a digital camera that you can't possibly reproduce in the ink. So here you see the difference, all the gray areas in one are colors that don't reproduce. The reason we obsessed about those things is we think the presentation is important. Um, if you went to the French Laundry or Manresa or some other great restaurant and they served you on paper plates, plastic forks, <laughs> the food would be the same but the presentation would suffer. So we wanted to make sure that all of the book was at the same quality level. So now I'm just going to walk through a little bit of what's in the book. Um, volume one is called History and Fundamentals, and that's what it's about. Uh, it's mostly material you'd never find in a classic cookbook, but part of our idea here is that there's a set of techniques and um, recipes and methods and knowledge that the world had developed over the course of the last 10 or 20 years, but which is very hard to learn. Uh, if you wanted to learn the techniques in the book, you'd have to work at a restaurant like El Bui in um, Spain. I was there last week. Um, or the Fat Duck. I was actually there this week. <laughs> actually, no, it was last week. Last week. 
uh, early last week. Um, so uh, you'd have to work there for a couple years before you would see the, some of the techniques, and even then you wouldn't get all of them. Some of the techniques come from food science labs, they come from all over the place, but I realized that there, these techniques have been developed, but there was no good place to learn them. There's no good place they all came together. And besides the actual techniques and the, the mechanics of doing the cooking, there's lots of background information. What is the history that motivates this? What's the science behind it? So uh, we cover all kinds of, of, uh, of things in there, going all the way back actually from fire all the way up to the history of modern cooking. We cover things like, um, uh, well, we've got some slides. We cover things like the physics of food, how heat moves through food, um, so forth. Volume two is called Techniques and Equipment. And so it takes a different view of food. It's about, as it says, techniques and equipment. And it starts with about a 200-page chapter, so almost a whole book, that's about traditional cooking. We go through every technique in traditional cooking. We explain how it works, what are the physical principles behind it. Because a classic recipe tells you, do this, do this, do this, and you get a result. And if you don't care why, or you don't want to do why, that's enough. But it's hard, if you want to deviate from that recipe, insight as to why you're doing the things is really important. So the point of this uh, volume is to say, here's the insight behind how those techniques work, so you can understand it well enough that you can go cook uh, in your own way. Or if you're not into cooking, you can do it just because you're curious about it. Um, you know, people ask me often, who is this book for? Is it for professionals? Is it for home cooks? And I always say it's for people who are passionate about food who are also curious about it. Now, if you're not curious, then you know, I, I don't have much of a proposition. If you are, I think there's some cool stuff even if you don't cook. Volume three is called Animals and Plants. It takes an ingredient-oriented view of cooking. And of course, the two most important ingredients are plants and animals. So in this chapter, we go through the structure of meat. We go through uh, why some cuts of meat are tough and, and why some are not. We go through all of the different aspects of plants. And we have lots of recipes and techniques for dealing with those. Some of them are classic, but mostly we stayed away from the classic techniques, because lots of books have that. And we focused on the really new, interesting ones that let you do stuff you couldn't do any other way. I should say what I think modernist cooking means. And we really view it as two things. One is a style of cooking that breaks some of the traditional rules of cooking to let you do things you couldn't do any other way. And the second is using brand new techniques that break those rules, even if you're achieving a traditional outcome. So some of the, uh, of the food in the book is wild stuff like you'd find at some of these uh, uh, restaurants like El Bui in uh, Spain that may not even look like food or it looks like Klingon food. Um, there's other things that, where the outcome is totally traditional, um, either traditional Western food or we also have recipes in the book from Chinese, Japanese, Indian, and, uh, and other cuisines. So it doesn't matter what the outcome is so much as how you got there, and that's what we focus on. Uh, volume four is called Ingredients and Preparations. Here we look at ingredients, but uh, ingredients other than sort of meat versus plants, ingredients like thickeners. A huge part of traditional cooking is about how to make a sauce thick or how to give body to a soup. Uh, there's some traditional ways to do that. There's some modern ways. Uh, gels are another topic we cover. Now, one kind of a gel is cheese. Cheese is a protein gel made by coagulating milk. Uh, tofu is a protein gel by, made by coagulating soy milk. Uh, so we cover those, we cover gelatin, but we also cover lots of brand new kinds of gels because chefs have found ways to use these gels in lots of interesting uh, fashions. Uh, finally, we cover coffee and wine, uh, but in a somewhat irreverent way. Coffee is uh, one of the great beverages, but uh, it is really given short shrift by most chefs. Um, now, I'm from Seattle. In Seattle, we like obsess over coffee. One of the things I say in the book is a Michelin three-star restaurant often serves coffee that wouldn't be fit for a C Seattle street vendor. And it's really true. It's, there's a set of people who obsess about food and will go to any length to get the ultimate food. There's another set that obsess about the ultimate coffee. And pretty much, they're two different sets of guys. <laughs> and so the point of this chapter is bring them together. We also have a chapter on wine. 
that uh, takes sort of a science-oriented view of wine, trying to demystify it. Um, wine is almost like a secular religion. Uh, there's a whole ceremony associated with it. Uh, there's this whole notion of connoisseurship. Um, one of the techniques we discuss in the book is something we call hyperdecanting. This is where you take a bottle of wine, particularly a younger red wine. You, can, you, should, you should all try this at home. You pour it into a blender and you hit frappe. And you, let, you, you frappe the hell out of it for 30 seconds or so, let it calm down, then pour it in. It achieves what decanting achieves, but way more so. Now there's two reasons to do this. One is for a younger red wine, it makes it much more drinkable. And in most cases in a blind taste test, we preferred the hyper decanted to ordinary can, decanting it right from the bottle. But the other reason to do is it freaks wine people out so much. <laughs> oh my God. You go and you pour this great bottle of wine into the blender and hit the switch, and they, they, they look at you like you're a you know, complete lunatic. Um, but it works. <laughs> <clears throat> so volume five is the first volume in the whole book that actually looks like a cookbook. Uh, you know, we've got about 1,500 recipes in the book. The um, plate of dish recipes volume uh, takes about 50 recipes and goes, or 49, I guess, and goes in depth in them to give all, not just the main thing you're cooking, but the garnishes on the plate, and in most cases, the entire rest of the meal. So as an example, we went kind of nuts on barbecue, because I love southern barbecue. Um, I actually competed once in world championship of barbecue. Um, and we actually won, but not due to me, I was like the lowest ranking guy on the team. Uh, so we developed nine barbecue sauces for the book. And then we developed recipes for cornbread and baked beans, essentially an entire barbecue meal. And that's one of those 50 things in here. Now, one of the things that we thought was a huge value to our book um, was the use of cool pictures to both illustrate things you couldn't otherwise show people and to, to get people excited about concepts that might seem a little dull and boring. So this is from our section on canning. And if you have an acidic vegetable, in this case sort of a, um, pickled vegetables, you can do what's called boiling water canning. And this is our photo for boiling water canning. Uh, we use this idea of a cutaway throughout the book to try to illustrate the magic view of what's happening in your food while you cook it. And as you can see, not only do we cut the pot in half, we carrot cut the jars in half too, because what the hell. Um, we, we have lots of photos in, in all kinds of ways. This is a centrifuge jar. Um, we use a lot of interesting equipment in, uh, in cooking. A centrifuge subjects the liquid to a, a force equivalent to about 40,000 times Earth's normal gravity. That causes things to separate out. In this case, this is a sauce we made. This is actually a Hungarian goulash. It, it's separated into eight layers by density. Uh, now, you might say, why do you want to do that? And it turns out there's lots of reasons. Um, uh, you can take all kinds of food products and spin it in these centrifuges to, to achieve like a clear consomme or some other thing like that that you just couldn't get any other way. That also brings up a question, how much of this can you do at home? And I say, look, out of 1,500 recipes, at least half are easy to do in the home. If you're willing to buy a little bit of equipment, but nothing too exotic, just the stuff you can get at Williams Sonoma or, um, or some other mall uh, cooking store, it's maybe 75% of the book. And the last 25, good luck. Because that's when you need to get liquid nitrogen doers and, um, no seriously, we have a whole section on cooking with liquid nitrogen, it's fantastic. It lets you make stuff super cold without making it wet. Uh, whereas ice, of course, doesn't let you do that. Um, and that last 25% you can do at home, I do it all at home, uh, but it's gonna require a little bit of effort. Uh, here's uh, uh, something where we're uh, using a torch to sear things. Uh, this is pomegranate seeds. Uh, here's another one of our cutaway photos. This is uh, a, a traditional pot roast in a Dutch oven. Uh, this is enzyme peeled grapefruit. Uh, it turns out there's an enzyme called peelzyme, and you can soak citrus in it, and it only attacks the, uh, a special um, uh, pectin molecule that's in the outer uh, thing. So you, you soak it in there and it all pulls off. But it also makes it look kind of cool. Uh, this is potato starch in a potato. Uh, this is uh, the um, 
purple things are the actual starch granules, and the blue lines are the cell walls of the potato. Uh, here's an example spread where we show what's going on. This is, a, uh, this is actually the first picture I took for the book to see if this cutaway thing would work, and it kind of did. Um, this is steaming broccoli. So all of the little text boxes around the outside explain what's going on. You know, what's happening with the boiling? What's happening with the condensation? How is it heating it? Up in the corner, there's a, uh, uh, there's a box that describes the difference between boiling and steaming. In theory, steaming ought to have much higher heat transfer. In practice, it actually doesn't for a bunch of reasons we explain in the text. It's actually slightly slower to steam uh, uh, broccoli than it is to uh, boil it. Uh, here's our wok cutaway. Uh, now, we discovered why people don't cook with half a wok here. Um, <laughs> this caught fire three times while we were doing it. Because there's actually no trick to this. We were cooking with a wok that was cut in half. Now, not exactly in half. We cut about a third of it off. But the oil kept going on the fire, and it would catch fire. <laughs> it was, it was a, but we had this great motto. It only has to look good for a thousandth of a second. <laughs> And so a lot of these photos, people say, well, what's the trick? Aren't you using Photoshop? And well, every digital photographer uses Photoshop, but mostly the trick is willingness to make a mess. Um, here's, here's that uh, same picture now uh, where we can zoom in and see a bunch of the different text things explaining it. Here's our barbecue cutaway. Um, so those coals are just sitting there at the edge. That's really cut in half, and they kept falling off. But again, it only has to look good for a thousandth of a second. Uh, what we explain here is all of the things that go on in grilling uh, hamburgers. And it turns out there's lots of interesting dynamics. Those drops of fat that fall are crucial because those flare-ups produce most of the characteristic grilled flavor. You get a different flavor from grilling like this than if you broil it from the top, even with the same amount of heat. The reason is from the top, you don't get those fat fires happening. Uh, this is how you cut things in half. This is our machine shop. Uh, my company uh, has a whole laboratory where we prototype inventions that we come up with, and this is our shop. Uh, and we decided to build our uh, kitchen laboratory, where we made the book, right around the corner from this. So whenever we want to cut something in half, we come over here. Um, here is a short video. This is a wire EDM machine, and we've got a pot coming in. Uh, wire EDM uses uh, very high uh, electrical current. It makes tiny sparks. You can see them there. The whole thing happens underwater, believe it or not. Uh, and those tiny sparks jumping off this brass wire actually will cut any kind of a metal or a conductive surface. So you come out and voila, we have cut the pot in half. Uh, we had other machines we would use to cut glass in half or uh, all kinds of other things. So there's some of the things cut in half. Um, like I say, we have two halves of one of the best kitchens in the world. They're just not together anymore. <laughs> Um, you can see with the uh, one pot there, a technique we used to, to keep stuff in, we would glue a piece of Pyrex in front of the, the pot. Now that gives you a little glue line, but there, that's where Photoshop is handy, because you can photograph the other side of the pot. When you cut it in half, you get two halves. So you photograph the edge in the same position, and then you can swap it in. Um, it's a lot like in a Hollywood movie where a guy flies through the air supported by a wire, and then they digitally take the wire out. Uh, here's, um, here's one of our nerdier parts of the book. This is our uh, chapter on heat and energy. Uh, so we have partial differential equations in the cookbook. Um, the cookbook has the strange distinction that I wrote thousands of lines of code to write the cookbook, because we used lots of computer simulations to uh, understand things like heat con conductivity, uh, like the diffusion of a brine. If you brine a meat, that's also run by a diffusion equation. So uh, I, tons of code were written to, to write this book, and here are some of the equations. Here's a, an, another example of a, a thing. Suppose you've got a barbecue. Well, as you move away from the hot surface, the heat fa falls down, right? And if you move far enough away, there's hardly any heat at all. But what does that curve actually look like? Well, we calculated it. Um, most of the heat is not coming from hot air there. It's coming from infrared uh, rays. And so you can calculate how much radiation is emitted. Uh, it's important not only for how the heat varies as you move vertically, but how even is the heat as you move side to side. 
And that funny horn-shaped thing is what we call the sweet spot. That's the zone for which the side-to-side -side heat variation isn't more than about 10%. So if you want the best results, that's where you should be grilling. Uh, here's an example of a step-by-step -step technique. Uh, this is one for making hamburger, believe it or not. Uh, one of the philosophies we had with the book is that any dish is worthy of a, that's worthy of a cook's attention is worthy of refinement. So we set out to make the ultimate hamburger. Now, our idea of the ultimate hamburger may not be yours, and you might want to just run down to In-N-Out Burger and get something really quick, and that's perfectly fine. But if you care about a burger, you can lavish as much care on a burger as you could on uh, some, uh, some otherwise very fancy French dish that involves foie gras and 50 ingredients. In this case, the key, there's a technique in how you grind the burger. Because believe it or not, the alignment of the grain matters. So what we're doing here is we're trying to align the grain so that if you see the, the cut in half burger, all of those tubes of meat that, that sort of get pushed out of the grinder are all vertical. And that means when you bite it, it crumbles better. And crumbling or being very tender is important in a sandwich because when you pull away, you don't want to pull away and leave the burger <laughs> pulled out of the rest of it, right? It's got to all come down uh, directly. Um, so here, here's the close-up of the technique of how you align the grain. It's very simple. Um, but once you've tried it both ways, this way is better. Um, here's the actual burger. Um, it's a wonder what you can do when you suspend gravity. Um, it, here in the book, we actually cover the recipe for everything that you see there. The bun, the sauce, uh, the lettuce is infused with a uh, smoke. Uh, because that, that gives you a kind of a, a cool smoky thing while it stays crunchy. Uh, the, not only do we show you how to grind the burger, but what mix of meats to use for the burger. And we even developed a cool technique for cooking the burger that involves liquid nitrogen. Um, uh, our idea of an ultimate burger is that it's perfectly medium rare, edge to edge, but really, really crispy on the outside. So we do that by cooking it sous vide in an unsealed bag uh, to medium rare. Then we put it in liquid nitrogen for about 45 seconds. Then we put it into a deep fryer. Now the deep fryer makes the outside super crispy. The point of the liquid nitrogen is that it freezes and chills enough of the burger that it doesn't overheat the inside. So you don't get these big bands of gray. Normally if you cook something under high heat, you get a big band of gray and we kind of wanted to avoid that. Come on, you can do it. So. Here's a cool thing. Um, we, uh, we got a, a, a video camera at the lab that, um, let's see, whoops. So this video camera shoots uh, uh, HD video at 6,200 frames per second. So I'm gonna go back actually and show you the other, whoops, whoops, whoops. So the first one's a water balloon and the miracle of this is uh, no one's told the water it's time to fall yet. The, uh, the balloon itself is, is under tension, so it pulls away very quickly. But it, the inertia of the mass, so it's a little bit like when Wile E. Coyote would run off a cliff and he wouldn't fall until he looks down. So then um, in our gels chapter, I decided to give a recipe for ballistics gelatin. Because people see it on CSI or you see it on Mythbusters. So what the hell? Why not have a recipe for ballistics gelatin? Well, if you have a high-speed camera and you have a block of ballistics gelatin lying around, pretty soon someone says, hey, let's shoot it. <laughs> this is popcorn, so watch really closely. Popcorn illustrates a really important principle uh, uh, about the physics of water, which is when water boils to steam, it expands by about a factor of 1,600. So that's what's happening here. The, it's, right now, there's a little bit of steam issuing from a fissure in the bottom. You can watch it expand. It's trying to relieve the pressure, but ultimately it can't, and so it pops. Now, this is something that would be better in an electronic version of the book. So we did shoot some video for it, but the sequence of, uh, of pictures still works. If you want to make an omelet, you got to break a few eggs. So we did. Um, and again, this is the, the kind of thing that happens when you have a high-speed camera. Um, pretty soon, everything looks like it needs shooting. <laughs> <laughs> so
So uh, that's, I've got, you know, almost infinitely more material, but I thought at this point we'd, uh, Jeff and I will talk a little bit and then we can take questions. So that was really cool, thank you. Um, so one thing I was asking you uh, before you got started yeah. is, why didn't you use food stylists? And I'd love to hear your answer on that, because well, I thought uh, it was so good. So w we had two philosophies on that. The first is that part of cooking is presenting. And if you, uh, we thought it was our jobs, the jobs of the cooks and everybody else, to make the food the way we wanted to see it. And so if we went and did that, then, uh, we did our job right, we should just be able to take the picture. We shouldn't have a stylist coming to tell us how to fake the picture with all sorts of other things. But the, the, the other reason is we didn't want our pictures to look like everybody else's pictures. And, uh, and so, you know, when we set out, out to do this, I told one of the people we were interviewing for art director, I said, look, I want to show people a view of food that they've never seen before. And this person's like, well, how many cookbooks are there? How many magazines are there? How can you do this? Well, we found a way to do it. I don't think we would have found that way if we just had a professional food stylist do what they do. Yeah, because I've never seen anything like this. They're truly amazing. Um, another thing, uh, when we were talking before this, you said that this actually started out as an outline for a 400-page book or something like 600, that? 600, yeah. Okay. Uh, so about five years ago, I realized that there were all of these techniques out there, but there was no good place to learn it. And I realized that because I was learning it. And I'm like, well, damn it, I wish there was one big definitive place you could go. Uh, and in many fields, there's a textbook like that, the big definitive textbook, and that's where everybody learns. Um, there wasn't something like that here. I thought, well, okay, maybe I'll write it. And so I wrote an outline, and my first outline from four and a half years ago is almost the same as the book we wrote. But the page budget was 600 pages, so we were terrible at estimating. But this is one of these things where once we got in, there was no turning back. And uh, so I tried to get your book, and obviously it's oversold. Um, do you have plans on publishing more? Sure. So the, the, well, this is, <clears throat> well, uh, I had somebody come up to me at an um, event, and they said, you know, I just love your book. It's fantastic, but your publisher is a complete idiot. And I said, well, actually, I'm publishing the book. <laughs> um, and, yeah, I am an idiot. And uh, on a bunch of things, I always say, look, it's the first 2,400-page cookbook I've ever written. Uh, and... You know something? It's the first 24-page cookbook the world's ever written. So we tried to guess what the first printing should be. And I wanted to print 6,000. Uh, Mark over there, Jacques, it's his fault. He, he's, he wanted 5,000. We compromised at 6,000. Um, and uh, we, uh, yeah, so it shows how much pull I have, huh? Um, and we did all these spreadsheets about like, how much would it cost to warehouse them for three years just in case. Um, and so forth. And we'd actually had sold the 6,000 before they even shipped. Uh, so the, the interest in the book turned out to be way bigger than we did thought. Yeah, so um, we've ordered 25,000 more. And I told you to get more. And well, I, you know, I put a thing on our blog asking, just soliciting lots of input and say, hey, we're trying to decide how many to print. And so we had a lot of people make suggestions. And uh, I decided on 25,000. I've got a in about six weeks, I need to make a decision about whether I add more for this year. Uh, and the big unknown there is Christmas, because Christmas, of course, you sell a whole lot more than before. But usually the way people model that is they model that on a baseline, where you say, okay, if this is the baseline, I'll, I'll sell about five times more during the month of December than I would baseline. What's my baseline? Is my baseline, you know, the incredible sales we've had now, or is there just you know, 7,000, or actually we're up to about 9,000 now, 9,000 lunatics that want the book and that's it? We won't sell another single one? Okay, well, good. You know, on the way here, um, I was thinking, boy, this is a really dumb, another one of these dumb publisher moves. I'm coming to, tell, to talk to a bunch of people who get three excellent meals a day provided by you, so why should they buy a cookbook? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, speaking of fabulous meals, uh, you mentioned that you've eaten at the Fat Duck in Abu Ali. What is your favorite restaurant? Do you have one? What's your favorite meal? Do you have a favorite meal? So, uh, I like lots of different kinds of food. Um, and I don't have a single favorite meal. Uh, the most interesting restaurant in the world, by far, in my view, is El Bui in, in Spain. I, I love the Fat Duck. I love lots of other things. but. Uh, El Bui changes its menu totally every year. 
Uh, they're only open for six months of the year. The other six months of the year, uh, they are doing R&D to develop new recipes. Uh, the bad news is it's closing in June for good. Um, so that's why last week I, <laughs> I went. <laughs> uh, so after this, oh, the, oh, too bad. I, the, our, our, our kitchen laboratory popped up there. If it pops up again, I'll... I heard you uh, performed an experiment to understand barbecue stall better. Yes. I would like to hear you expand a little bit. It sounds like you cooked one <clears throat> in a right. uh, sous vide container and that that um, heated up significantly Okay, so, so let me give a little background. So uh, if you Google barbecue stall, S-T-A-L-L, -L, well, you'll get a few links that are about um, a stall that sells barbecue like at a state fair. But if you say barbecue stall temperature, you'll get literally thousands of hits because one of the great mysteries of barbecue is called the stall. And here's what happens. You cook a brisket or a pork shoulder, a whole hog, some big piece of meat, and you watch the temperature, and initially you put it in, and the temperature increases, 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 then it stalls. And it still, it's way below the temperature of the air in the barbecue. And it stays stalled for hours, two hours, four hours, sometimes even more. Then it starts going back up again. So what the hell is the stall? And these thousands of, of pages in the net are all about people trying to explain what the stall is about. And the usual explanation is that what's happening is that collagen in the meat is being converted into gelatin. And that process is what makes tough meat tender. Uh, it's also what makes um, uh, stock that you cook for a long time, like a veal stock, sort of unctuous and rich. And it makes it gel up if you let it get cold. Well, that process was surely happening, but I realized there was nowhere near enough energy in that reaction that it could take all of that heat out. And so it had to be something else. So I realized there's only one thing it could possibly be, and that's the evaporation of water. That in fact what you're doing is you are drying out your big piece of meat. And something called evaporative cooling. The same reason you feel cool when you get out of a pool, um, unless it's 100% humidity outside. So in fact what was happening is that uh, you would go through a long period of drying, then as soon as it was, it was the outside was dry, then the temperature could, could start going back up. So to prove that, we did an experiment where we took one brisket, cut it in half. Um, one of them we sealed in a plastic bag, just so there'd be no evaporation. You could also seal it in aluminum foil, and we tried that too. It doesn't make any difference. And then, so we put them both in there. We had temperature probes stuck all over both of them. And we put them into a, um, a convection oven. Uh, that let us control the temperature better than a real barbecue. We could have also done it in a barbecue, but the same uh, thing would happen. Sure enough, the one that was uncovered stalled for about two and a half hours, and then it went back up. Um, the one which covered up, no stall at all. And any um, collagen, anything like that, would be in both of them. So it, it, we, we sort of... I think definitively showed that. Was there more humidity in the oven when you cooked the one that Oh, was so we also had a, a thermometer in the oven and what's called a wet bulb thermometer. So this measures the actual humidity. So what happens is the humidity of the oven initially goes up. Then over a period of time, the humidity goes down because there's some air venting out of the oven. So this is all about rates. You're gonna evaporate from a certain rate in the meat until you get such a dry crust on the meat that you can't evaporate at that same rate anymore. Meanwhile, you have another rate, which is the rate at which water is coming out of the oven. Now, one of the really funny things about this is when you're in the middle of the stall, the traditional wisdom is slather more sauce on. But this is like trying to heat something while you run a garden hose on it, okay? The more sauce you put on, the more there is for evaporation. So instead of stalling for two hours, you can make a stall for as long as you wanted if you just kept pouring water on it. So the takeaway I was looking for is I use dry rub instead yep. of uh, sauce when I'm cooking. Is that compatible with keeping it inside of a, a plastic? Sure. Okay. Sure, but the, the other thing is you have to, there's, there's different things you want to achieve at different parts of cooking the barbecue. So our high-tech approach to barbecue is we smoke. We, use, we use, typically put a dry rub on. Then we smoke at very low temperature. Then we cook it sous vide. And then at the end, we'll either smoke it again create a bark or crust on the outside. Or our best technique is, again, liquid nitrogen and a deep fryer. <laughs> so you haven't lived until you've had deep, liquid nitrogen deep fried spare ribs. Our, 
cooks, they're just totally wondering how we're <laughs> going to do this and how we're going to bring in liquid nitrogen. So one thing after Microsoft, yeah. well, how do, why did you get interested in cooking and how did you learn all So this? I was interested in cooking my whole life. Okay. Um, when I was nine, I told my mother I was going to cook Thanksgiving dinner. And she let me. I went to the library, got this whole stack of books out, and by God, I cooked Thanksgiving dinner all by myself. Ah, by today's standards, not so much. For a nine-year-old, I yeah, think. That's pretty ambitious, I gotta tell you. Um, well, but I've, I'm pretty ambitious. Uh, so uh, after that, I was a very enthusiastic, self-taught chef for, for many years. Finally, while I was working at Microsoft, I decided to go to chef school in France. Uh, and so I went to Bill Gates, and I asked him if I could have a leave of absence to go to chef school. This is the first such and, and only request he's ever gotten. And I say, I'm just curious. Well, I had enough leverage, I got it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but then, in order to go to the, the chef school, it wouldn't take me unless I had work experience. So I worked for one night a week at a French restaurant in Seattle called Rovers. Okay. A very traditional French chef uh, ran the place. And I'd go at about noon and cook all the way through the end of service uh, and go home. And I learned a tremendous amount there. Um, uh, in fact, when I eventually went to chef school, uh, this one morning we had, the assignment was boning ducks. And uh, I'd boned a lot of ducks at this restaurant. Um, not an admission I'd make most places, but I boned a lot of ducks. So th this, this morning, the assignment is to do this, and so I go out there and I start working away on the ducks. And the chef who's teaching this in France comes up, you, you there, where did you learn this? You know a duck like a Frenchman. <laughs> Which, <laughs> yes, exactly. I, fig I figured I, that was a good thing. <laughs> uh, so then uh, I was also always interested in technology and science. I never uh, became a chef professionally. I mean, there's probably a parallel universe where I did, but instead I uh, became a physicist, actually. I got a PhD in physics. Um, I worked for Stephen Hawking, uh, but then took a leave of absence for a summer to work on a software project, and we started a company, and then after a couple of years, Microsoft bought the company, and whatever. So then, finally, when I retired from Microsoft, I started cooking a lot more. I had a lot more time to cook, and that's where I really started getting into all of the real cutting-edge techniques. I said, well, what's the highest technology cooking anyone's doing? And that led to all of this. Oh, yeah, there's. Yeah, there it goes. <laughs> so real, real quick, I, I went on to JB Prince before you came yeah. in. I was looking for a centrifuge, and they don't have one on their website. Where can I get one? Uh, so you get centrifuges at, um, uh, at laboratory supply places, but they're used in every um, hospital mm -hmm. uh, for spinning blood right. and for doing medical tests. So n there's, uh, there's actually a, a, a – there's probably – three places in the Bay Area that are used centrifuge dealers, okay. um, where you can get a used reconditioned one. You can also buy them new. No dentists. Um, <laughs> they're really cool. Yeah. OK, so it looks like we have a lot of questions. Uh, yep. Yeah, my question would be, what are the sort of top three things that everybody does wrong that you learned that you know the average home cook could do just slightly differently and, and make a big difference? Well, uh, wrong is, a, is sort of a, a tough thing, but I'll, I'll give you a couple of, of quick tips. I'm not saying anyone's going to cook wrong, but right. the first one is if you're making an omelet or scrambled eggs, here's like a tremendous trick to, to take you there. If you're making a three-egg omelet or sc scrambled egg, throw one egg quite away. They're cheap. So two whole eggs, one yolk. Enormously improves the texture. Uh, there are people who add butter or cream. You can also do that but you get mu much of the same improvement in texture of butter of cream just by throwing one white away. Um, the second thing is, it's best if you cook it under extremely low heat. So we cook it in a water bath, or we cook it in a steam oven, and we cook it to exactly 71 uh, centigrade, 165 Fahrenheit. You can vary that a little bit depending for, for scrambled eggs. A Little bit hotter for uh, an omelet. And that lets you do just those two simple things, temperature control and throwing one egg quite away, totally changes omelets. So okay. not everything, but it's one trick. Hi. Uh, so a question about coffee. Yeah. Being from Seattle, you, of course, I'm sure experimented with making the ultimate cup of coffee. What kind of high-tech things would you recommend applying? So in the case of coffee, um, there's, there's a whole coffee community, which 
uh, largely started in Seattle about 20 years ago and now has broadened out. So there's lots of cool people around the world. There's a great guy in London doing uh, cool coffee work. There's a fantastic guy in Norway doing cool coffee work. And uh, some of these people I've met, and a lot of them I only know over the internet. But the state of the art coffee techniques uh, are all attention to detail things. I'd love to say oh, there's this magic machine, but mostly it's super good temperature control in the machine. So there's a machine called a Seneso made in Seattle, which is a fantastic espresso machine. Um, La Marzocco also has a pretty cool one. Uh, the next interesting thing after of good temperature control, so that means using a, something called a PID, a, a, um, uh, a proportional inter, integral dif, uh, differential um, temperature controller. Anyway, it controls the temperature perfectly. The next thing is something called pressure profiling, and that's just now um, happening. There's only a few machines uh, there's probably no really good machine on the market yet that really, in a broad way, does pressure profiling. What that allows you to do is to say the pressure that you make when you make espresso goes over a set of things. Now, that's for espresso. Then there's, a, there's a half a dozen other things I could go, go into about making the ideal espresso. For regular coffee, my favorite way to make it is something called an AeroPress. And it's like a $29 piece of plastic that you buy on Amazon. And you know those super soaker kinds of... Well, it's like a super soaker, but you put it over your, um, your coffee cup, and you, hook, cook, you heat the water to exactly 175 degrees, medium grind, but like a drip grind, not an espresso grind. And we, we have all the rest. It's a few other things. You, you wait for 30 seconds, and then you plunge it. It's fantastic. Thank you. So I had a question about the, uh, the lab you set up and yep. the co-authors for the books. So yep. could you go into how you selected these folks in the dream team and what are they doing now that the book is out? Uh, so, uh, you know, I realized so, uh, if I hadn't written software, I never would have written this book because, you know, most books are one person's singular vision and that's really what defines those books. Um, and one person can write a piece of software, but usually the best software isn't written by a single person, because A, there's only so much a single person can do. Usually a small team. A really big team has a hard time equaling the productivity of a smaller team. And so we always wanted like six to ten people was the ideal size software team in, in my view. But I also wasn't afraid of having a team like that and even having a larger team of people around it. And because I wasn't afraid of that, uh, as soon as I realized that this book, scale was an important thing for the book. If I, if I got all of these topics together in one place, I could really achieve something because people could learn it all in one place. But if you only have half of them, eh, you did a little something, but people still have to scramble to find the other half. So I decided at some point, hey, this is going to be a team project. So I hired a guy who'd worked at the Fat Duck, which was this fantastic restaurant in, in England. Now, he'd been a chemist and a graduate student at the University of Washington prior to that, so he also understood science a lot. Um, I hired an editor, actually, even before I, I decided to do the book, from Scientific American. I made him the editor-in-chief, and then we just sort of picked people one at a time. Um, all the photos were taken by me and my assistant, although my assistant wound up taking 90% of them. Um, and he was a guy who answered a Craigslist ad for being my... Uh, uh, Photoshop guy. I, initially, I thought I only really needed an assistant to help me with the lights and to do the Photoshopping. And th this guy had just come out of uh, an art school. He'd taken, he had just finished his photography thing. So not deep experience, but thank God not deep experience because it allowed us to develop a style that was really different and unique, which is what you see in all these pictures. And what they're doing right now is most of them still work for me. <laughs> I mean, some of them are freelance, you know, they, they were um, graphic artists that would do this picture or that picture, but most of them still work for me and we're uh, working on promoting the book and uh, figuring out what we do next. Uh, hi, thanks for a great talk. Um, I noticed that your tagline is uh, a revolution in the art of cooking, um, and I think it's, you know, patently obvious to everyone that you really advanced the science of cooking and, you know, sort of bringing all this together. How does it change the art? Obviously, there's some art in these pictures, um, but like, you know, what do you think about okay, that? Okay, well, there's, there's two answers to that. The first is, um, you know, en engineering underlies art. Uh, there are a bunch of masterpieces that Leonardo da Vinci created that are lost because he tried it like a brand new technique for the 
paint and the damn paint fell off the wall. Um, so empowering chefs by giving them new techniques, and there's the kitchen again. It, it's in a space that used to be a uh, Harley Davidson dealership um, uh, and service center. And then they moved, and we still get these guys that look like they came out of a ZZ Top video coming up and saying, well, where do I get my AUG serviced? <laughs> so, well, they moved down the street. Um, so we, we took it and turned it into this. Uh, so anyway, to answer your question, the rest of your question, so part of it of the art comes in enabling art through science and engineering. Part of it is we take a lot of effort in the book to discuss cooking as art. Uh, and one of the reasons we call it modernist cuisine is we draw a lot of parallels between modernism, which was this idea that changed art and architecture and literature, philosophy uh, in the uh, 19th and 20th centuries. Cooking never got its modernist period, I argue, until now. And so we think that, in fact, this is about art. And I love to point out that cooking is an art. You know, uh, art is about engaging us through our emotions. And, and the, the analogy I like best is actually to architecture. Um, because architecture is necessary. Painting and sculpture are not quite as necessary, but you need a roof over your head. And so most buildings in the world are pretty dull. They're warehouses and they're, they're truly dull buildings, but they're necessary. Uh, most meals in the world are the same way. They're not art. They're necessary because we need f food as fuel for our bodies. But in both food and architecture, you can create amazing artistic things that grab your emotions and uh, thrill people in a way like nothing else can. So. Thanks. I was curious if you went off at all on the tangent of nutrition. Um, so that oh, we, we went off on bit. so many tangents in this book, it's ridiculous. So. Um, uh, one of the things, uh, that's the urchin on a uh, cocoa noodles. <clears throat> uh, so in our thing on heat and energy, everybody knows that uh, their various electrical appliances draw watts. Well, we put a little biography of James Watt in and <laughs> explained why those things are called watts. Uh, we have a whole chapter called Food and Health, which covers nutrition, sort of. I don't mean we comprehensively cover nutrition, but we decided to tackle a very controversial issue, which is what food is good for you and what food is not good for you. Because there's a tremendous amount of popular information about this. This is often ascribed to medical science. But the actual truth of those things which are really well proven and those things which currently there's still significant uncertainty, that's not communicated very well. So we have a whole chapter about that, and that includes you know, how to read. If you see a press release that says there's a risk factor is increased for this by doing, what does that really mean? What, what does a 95% confidence interval mean on one of those studies? Uh, so one example is some of the things people say are bad for you really do seem to be bad for you. Um, trans fats really do seem to be bad for you. Um, saturated fat and butter. Actually, there's very little proof. In fact, some people would say there's no proof at all that it's bad for you. Uh, and we give a, kind of a tragic example in the book. There's a study called the Nurses Study that followed the health of 86,000 nurses for 25 years. One subgroup were the margarine eaters. And in the era, which is mostly the 1970s and 80s, in this era, they were eating margarine because they thought it was good for you. It was polyunsaturated. Then they had another group that said, damn it, they're going to eat butter. The margarine eaters have four times the death rate of the butter eaters. Because in that era, although it was very well-meaning to think polyunsaturated must be better for you than saturated, there was no proof. And the way they got the polyunsaturated was the cheapest way, which was to make trans fats. And so this is one of these things where a little knowledge actually can be dangerous. Yep. Hello. Thank you for your uh, presentation. I'm a fellow physicist, and you talk a lot about temperature control. Yep. I would like you, if you could expand a little bit on the spectrum of actually the heat producing elements in barbecues or okay. in kitchens, because what I don't understand when I came to the US and I saw people grilling on a flame, you're like, yeah. how does that change the spectrum? And you're like, I mean, are there benefits to doing that? Okay. So, uh, the simple answer to that is no, but here's the <clears throat> thing. That there's most traditional approaches to cooking uh, start with a very high heat source. Originally, that was a fire. 
But you never want to cook the food to that as hot as the fire is. Okay, it would burn. Uh, the other thing is most food is mostly water. And as a result, you can't actually make the food hotter than the boiling point of water until you've dried out the outside at least. Uh, so a typical cooking technique says I have this super high heat and then I cook with it by timing very carefully how long I put it in that high heat and how long I, I take it off. And that's true whether you're cooking in a pot, you're cooking on a grill, you're cooking on, a, uh, on other things. Um, a, a, now, the more modern approach, which we describe in the book, it says, no, screw it, you should cook with low temperature. So if you want to cook meat medium rare, that means you want to make the meat about 130 Fahrenheit. So the way we do that, we cook at about 132 Fahrenheit. So we use a very low temperature source, low temperature steam or water in a water bath. It, ta it takes longer for the heat to soak in, but you never can overcook it. If you forget it an hour, it doesn't matter. Um, if you're a little bit early, it doesn't matter either. You're only off by a fraction of a degree. So that's a very fundamental thing. Now, you ask about grilling. Grilling is cooking with infrared rays. Those infrared rays uh, mostly come over other hot things, and simply a gas flame is a poor way to do it. That's why most good gas grills have a metal plate in there that the flame goes on, and it's the heat from that plate that is going on to your, your food. Uh, in the case of um, barbecue coals, what looks like fire around them is actually little particles that are being heated up to incandescence. Um, and the blueness of the flame has nothing to do with the spectrum. There is a thing where the hotter something gets, the bluer the color is. It's nowhere near hot enough for it to be blue. That's a chemical blueingness that, that creates that. More answers maybe than you wanted, but there you go. Uh, any other questions? All right, Nathan, anything else you'd like to say? Or? No, I. All right, well, thanks so much for coming. I uh, love the cookbook. <laughs>